Hello everyone. Uh, I know it's been a long time since I've done a full length video like this. I've been uh, traveling and sick and, and so on. So now here I am back in Canada um, and I thought I would take the opportunity. I've got my video camera fixed and got some time. So I would make a another video, kind of an Ask a Monk video, um, because this is a, a question I've been asked a lot lately, and I guess I'm always asked a lot, and it's often a question I don't answer. It's the question about karma and uh, you know, in inability, people's inability to understand or accept karma, and or you know, really understand how it works. <coughs> So this video is meant to address that. Hopefully it will do an adequate job. Um, the first thing we have to understand about karma is that it, like everything else... Well, first of all, we have to understand that what karma is in a Buddhist context. Um, because the word karma is actually a Sanskrit word. It's a word that was used by the Hindu... Uh, Brahmins and the it's used in the Upanishads and more most originally it's used in the Vedas. Now in the Vedas it was the Vedas are a religious text that the Hindus still um, respect and revere. Um, but they they they're a text that was uh, originated with a group of people called the Aryans who were horse riding nomads and, and anyway their their uh, understanding of karma meaning action you know, the word simply means action was that when you performed a certain action with the body or or, or end with speech um, it was somehow there was somehow a power to it now there even in the Vedas there wasn't really a um, belief or understanding that some result would come from it, simply that the action was uh, important, was 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 sacred, and was a part of their religious activity. I mean, there were even groups in India uh, performing these rituals up until like the 1970s, who who understood it to just be important as a ritual practice, not necessarily because it brought one to heaven or to enlightenment or so on. So there, there was this very ritualistic idea of karma, and even up into the Buddha's time, there were groups uh, who in India who believed this that the the gods or or even just it was a part of nature that certain actions had certain physical or or verbal actions had uh, karmic potency or had had some sort of potency to them that when performed. Um, perhaps gave good results, or were simply uh, the the proper the the um, the re required action of 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 religious individuals, and so so people would have to hire or or um, enlist the Brahmins, these priests, to perform these rituals at certain periods during their life in marriage or whatever. They they would have to have certain rituals in order to to ensure the uh, success of their marriage. You might think like in, in, certain in certain religious traditions when you get married you're supposed to break glass or, or you're supposed to throw rice or so on uh, at someone's marriage. <clears throat> so these are examples of, of karma that, uh, that goes according to this sort of belief. So in Buddhist tradition karma, karma is something quite different and in fact you might say that the Buddha denied this whole idea of karma, of, of action as having any potency. In fact, uh, it's quite clear according to the Buddha's teaching that um, there is no potency to physical or verbal action. The only thing that is karmically potent is intention. Um, so whether it's an action that is performed intentionally or a speech that is made intentionally or simply a mental act that, um, that is, is based on some, with some um, intention so so some volition some some <clears throat> uh, 
um, idea of, of wanting something, of liking something or disliking something, some fixed idea or intention in the mind that has, has karmic pot that has karmic potency or that has the potential to bring, in this case, bring, bring happiness or bring suffering, to, to have a, a, a result that is either beneficial or harmful. So the point being that if you, according to Buddhism, if you were to step on an ant without knowing that the ant was there, there's no karmic potency to to that act in particular. Now, if you're um, running around um, mindlessly, you might say that there's some karmic potency to being mindless, for example. Um, but but you're, you're not, you wouldn't be responsible for killing insects that you you step on. But you might be responsible in a general sense for being negligent. So this is also in accordance with uh, the law of, of most civilized countries where uh, it requires some mental uh, volition to, 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 acute, to, to charge someone but it can also be seen as being negligent. So this is, this is considered to be a generally karmic, karmically potent action. Now, the point being here that according to Buddhism, as with everything in Buddhism, Karma is, is experience is based on experience, is based on our moment to moment interaction with reality. It's not based on belief or theory or some magical property that exists in the universe. Karma is not something that that is unexplainable, that's that's like God that somehow exists in the world, and yet it's completely just and and um, cause and effect based because it deals with moment-to-moment -moment interactions of mental, of mind states. So kind of in the way as you might think of, of how cause and, effects work, cause and effect works on a physical level, karma works on a mental level. So you know, you, when, when, when one particle hits another particle, it causes a chain reaction. It causes a reaction in the particle in which it, it uh, affects. Now in the same way, a mind, the mind state Every mind state, so if you get angry, it has an effect on your own mind, it has an effect on the world around you, but it has an effect on a momentary uh, level. So every moment, the meaning every moment in which we in make have an intention, that's a karmic, <coughs> a karmic act, even before we've acted, because the only reason that you, you give rise to violent speech or violent acts is because of violent intentions, for example. The, 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 the only the, the basis behind evil actions and, and speech is is evil thought. If a person says something innocently, says something with the intention of, of bringing a person happiness, but circumstances being what they are, um, it, it leads to suffering for that person. Well, there, some people would believe, well, that's then a bad karma. It's it's some, that person did a bad action, right? It, it, unintentional, but still karmically potent because it had bad results. Buddhism denies this. Uh, Buddhism speaks against this. The idea that um, the result determined the, the karmic potency, that, that the, the physical world determines whether something is karmically potent. You see, so even, even if, if one is to do, to do something that, has a bad, that seems to have a bad result, Buddhism says it wasn't because of that uh, action. It, it wasn't. It isn't the person's fault. So when you step on an ant and the ant dies, if you didn't realize there was an ant there and you were being mindful enough to, to you know, to watching where you were going to to the extent uh, appropriate, then you're not guilty for the ant's death. Um, not not by that action. So uh, why this works and how this works? This is this is obviously a controversial topic. For, so first of all, how this works is that is is an understanding of how happiness and suffering comes, or an understanding of what we mean by karma, or what we mean of being a good deed or a bad deed. In Buddhism, good and bad deeds are such because they bring happiness or suffering to the individual who performs the deeds. According to Buddhism, you can't bring happiness or suffering directly to another being. If I say something, a simple, ex simple example, if I say something nasty to you, it's up to you whether you're going to interpret that as as good or bad and whether you're going to suffer or not because of it. Uh, whether you interpret it simply as sound or whether you interpret it uh, as words and understand the meaning 
or whether you go the next step and say that's bad and I don't deserve that and, and, and attach and cling to it and therefore suffer. Even so far as if a person um, physically assaults you, it's still in your power to be free from suffering, to, to not suffer because of that. If your mind is clear, if you're able to see the reality as it is, that this is simply states of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. If, if this, you can see that the pain is just pain, the, the, the upset in the body is just, an, is just a physical um, experience then you can still be free from suffering, even if people are, are quote-unquote, causing you suffering or, 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 or inflicting suffering upon you. So, so to that extent, we, we can't measure, there, there's no, or well, karma isn't measured based on the results it brings to other people, the suffering or the happiness that it brings to others. What we, so what we can do is improve our own state. We can bring our minds to a greater state of peace and happiness or we can bring our mind our own minds to a state of greater agitation and suffering based on our actions this is direct when you get angry it, it, it makes you a more of an angry person when you have greed in the mind it makes you more of an addicted addictive person if you're mindful continuously on a regular basis you become a more mindful person you become a more peaceful person your mind becomes clearer you, you become more wise and if, if you dedicate yourself to learning to studying to examining reality uh, it, it makes you a more peaceful a more content and, and, and a happier person so these would be good karmas and, and, and the others would be bad karmas if you're a person who is egotistical who is conceited who is arrogant and so on this is a cause for your own suffering. It's going to lead you to become more attached and, and, and lead to states of experience that are, are unpleasant. <coughs> now, um, the, uh, another important aspect of understanding how this works is to understand that karma is not one-to-one. -one. So, the idea that my speech, if I say something to you with good intentions and it happens to bring you suffering, um, it, it, was, it, it was argued recently that this can bring, uh, th this can mean that that action was an unwholesome action or was a bad action. So th those are bad intentions. When you intend to do something and by chance or for whatever reason, it doesn't bring the intended consequence or it brings an unintended consequence that this is bad. This is a simplistic understanding of karma, the idea that, that look at, look at here you have an action that led to a bad result. And, um, the, you know, it, it, with just a little bit of thought, it's easy to see how this is a simplistic understanding of, of, of reality. Obviously, nothing exists in, in uh, isolation. It's not the case where my speech caused this, my, in innocent seeming speech caused this person suffering. There's, there are, you know, uh, millions or, or, or countless factors that have to be taken into account. And so, for this reason, and it's important to talk about how karma is not just one-to-one, -one, and in fact, there are many different kinds of karma. The first, the first um, categorization of karma deals with the type of effect that a karma, that karmic deeds have. So even those, those deeds that are karmically potent will not all have the effect of bringing a clear and, and um, visible result in, in the here and now. So the first type of karma is that which has, has this sort of result where you, you do something and it has a clear result. If you kill someone there are clear results that are going to come from it. You'll feel directly um, worried and guilty and afraid, your mind will be disturbed directly. Directly, you could say you will have um, you, you you have the police chasing after you. You know, have people wanting to take revenge on you. There will be you'll have a bad name spread about uh, if people find out about it and so on. So th there will be direct consequences to that act. So so this is how people normally think of karma, and they would say it, when you when you die when you die from this life, you you're born. Um, short-lived, so you're, you, you might be killed yourself in the next life, you might just mysteriously you know, get in a car accident and die and 
uh, and, and you might say that that's, that, that could be a direct consequence of, of this bad deed you did in a past life, for example. These are all what one would consider to be direct consequences of the deed. But the second type of karma is that which doesn't have a effect, an effect itself, but simply augments the effect of another karma. So if you, if you are, um, if you kill a person, and you happen to be a a, a known um, bad guy, you know, you're a known uh, suspect. So you, you've done other bad deeds or so on before, and they and, and they didn't find you out for them. The chances are likely that the police are going to find you out for 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 the the new deed. Why? Because the other karma that you did supported that, or 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 was a cause for greater. Uh, suffering. I mean that that's actually a, a fairly coarse example, but on a uh, on a on a detailed level, this is going on all the time. That the the various karmas that we do, if we do a lot of good deeds for people, um, then they're more than then it might just take something very small to get us a great positive result. So, for example, if you're very kind to people, and then you apply for uh, a, you know an award or a raise or some kind of honor of some sort much more likely for you to be able to get that that honor that that award or you do something that is honorable people are much more likely to give you an award for it if they have some idea that you're already a good person that you've done good deeds in the past so 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 point of being point being uh, all of those other karmas while they may not have brought any direct result themselves just being a nice person to people you see you know look I'm a nice guy and 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 good things still don't come to me why is this happening um could, you know, oftentimes is because the the effects are not um, direct themselves, but uh, they they provide the um, the basis for other deeds to have stronger or to to have more direct results, either either good or bad. So certain karmas are just supportive karmas, or or have some aspect of them is supportive for other karmas. A third type of karma is the, in the opposite direction, has to do is those karmas that reduce the effect of other karmas. So if you, um, if you you kill someone, if you do something very nasty, but people respect you, you know you're a respectable person, you might get away with it. If you've done things um, to the extent that it bring you know other people support you. So if you if you've got a group of people like the mafia, right? Okay, look at the mafia. Mafia, actually, there are good things going on there, right? They're, they're helping each other, so they're building up on a very gross level uh, a basis of, of, of protection. You know, you have this, this Mafia head and he does all sorts of nasty things, but he does a lot of good things for his cronies, so his cronies therefore support him, that kind of thing. If you, you know, do something that is really worthwhile, but um, you've done bad, you, you, you've, you've made a lot of enemies, then, on the on the other hand, you know the the fact that you made a lot of enemies might prevent your good deeds from bringing from coming to fruition, and this can of course pass over into the next life as well. Some people do a lot of good deeds, and yet they find people trying to block them at every step. Um, and so the idea being that this is the effect of bad past karma that is preventing. Uh, good karma from having the result, and this is this is going on all the time with us. This is why our lives are so mixed. We do good deeds, and we say, "Why aren't they having a direct consequence?" Well, you know, you have to take into account moment to moment karma in, over the infinite, the infinity that is our existence in samsara to 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 really understand why things are going the way they are. It's such a a mix or a matrix of of karmas that are at work at every moment that have created this reality and so to, to some extent karma it isn't something that exists apart from reality it's just a way of pointing out um, the um, probabilities or, or the patterns that exist in reality when you when you see how, how things work generally it, it's sort of a patterned um, pattern nature you know the, the, it doesn't just act randomly but things work reality works in in patterns so that um, the good things that you do have a tendency to bring you to to greater happiness but 
they still have to interact with other good deeds and bad deeds. So they, they have to be supported by other wholesome karmas. And so it's really not, a, the, the point being here, by, by looking at this, you can see it's not really a mysterious thing. Karma is not something like, wow, how could that be? You know, you kill someone and poof, you die in your next life. There's, you know, it, it, it's due to the con continuity from one moment to the next that, that we create moment after moment and we have this ripple effect that affects um, the, the world around us and affects our future. Okay, so this is the third type, and of course the fourth type is that type of karma which stops effects from occurring. So you might have done something very bad, but then you do something very good, and therefore they cancel each other out, right? You, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say you kill someone, it's hard to find something that would cancel it out. But when, when for example, um... When, for example, Angulimala is the, 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 the greatest example of, of how karma can be nullified. Angulimala killed, is this guy who killed 999 people, or, you know, killed a, a huge number of people, and would have been on his way to hell based on the, 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 the guilt and the, the perversion in his mind. But he became an arahant, and because of becoming an arahant, the, the greatness of that deed or the, the great change that occurred in his mind, it cut off all, all of that bad karma that would have taken him to hell. Now, of course, he suffered in this life. So there was the effect of, of karma to some extent. Some of the, the, karma, the karma did have some direct effect in terms of causing him to be beaten by the people when he went for alms and to have people, of course, spread a bad word about him and so on. But the the clarity and the purity in his mind was able to to completely destroy the 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 karma that would have led him to hell. M you know, mainly that's not mysterious either. It's just that in his mind there was no feeling of um, of, of of sorrow or or worry or fear. Um, you know, he understood that that what he had done was was totally and completely wrong, and um, and, and and gave it up completely. But had no negative feelings about it in terms of feeling sad or guilty or remorseful, which would have led him to, to, uh, to, to an unwholesome or an unpleasant mind state and lead him to, to cling to um, the existence or the, the, the images that would have led him to hell, for example. So this is the first categorization of karma, which I think does a lot to help people to, to understand in a very simple way how karma is not something magical it's not like god sitting up in heaven but it, it it's totally just in in that it points out that reality is not and there's no reason to believe that reality should be could be chance based reality is based on um cause and effect relationships between physical particles and mental states and the mind states work in a very similar way to the physical reality in terms of cause and effect Okay, so that's the first categorization. The second categorization is in terms of uh, the order in which they have an effect. So th this is starting, because th the second aspect of karma is in, in, in terms of rebirth. Now I've talked in other videos about how rebirth works according to Buddhism. B Buddhism doesn't believe in reincarnation in terms of a death here and, and, and a rebirth somewhere else. Buddhism simply denies the reality of the physical death. That physical death is simply the breakup of something that doesn't really exist in and of itself or whose existence in and of itself is dependent on the mind in the first place. Um, without experience you can't even talk about the physical realm. So to say that physical death is going to destroy the mind is really um, putting the card before the horse, or or or, or looking at things backwards, you, you you you're talking about the cause or the the result destroying the cause, which is is not really uh, logical or not, you know, not really reasonable. So, whatever happens at death, the the the, the physical breakup um, seems to to have the effect of um, disturbing the mind. You know, the mind is set, sent into some sort of disturbance, but it's certainly not um, destroyed or, or not not um, vanquished or, or, or you know, destroyed as a result. Uh, so, so I've talked about that before. That's not really what I want to talk about. Well, what we want to talk about is how it works 
when you die what, what sort of karmas do do bring lead on to the next life you know because at that point there's no there's nothing physical to create the next moment what is it that creates the next moment or or what sort of karmas um, are, are going to affect you uh, into the next life and <clears throat> so this is in accordant in in order of the um, potency of the karma so the first the first type of karma that is going to take effect that will always override other karmas is something called uh, weighty or heavy karmas these are karmas that uh, according to Buddhism are stronger and 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 totally override other karma so you can be a real a really really good and nice and kind person but if you perform one of the evil weighty karmas um, all of those other karmas are going to be useless and and for example when you die you're you're sure to go to a, to a bad place because of the um, irrevocable uh, nature of these karmas that they're 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 total and absolute they 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 totally destroy or they destroy your good intentions far beyond any the 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 ability of any other karma to 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 go in the opposite direction so for example killing your father killing your mother killing an enlightened being um, you know they, they, there there's not there's not so many of them killing uh, hurting a buddha because you could never kill a buddha um, causing a, a schism in the sangha, I believe those are the five. Causing a schism among the the Buddhist disciples. Uh, those five things are considered to be impossible to, or irreconcilable in this life. They're so strong that they have to take effect for at least the next life, and and most likely, you know, longer. They lead directly to hell. Those are the bad ones. So any other good deed that you've done is 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 useless. Is is not going not um, going to not capable of um, of of combating these um, evil karmas. On the good side are the um, the jhanas or, 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 or meditation, meditative states where if, if a person enters into a trance for example if a person passes away or, or even in this life um, the, the, if you're in a trance often bad deeds can be avoided so there are cases where people would enter into a very powerful trance and the power of it would, would allow them to avoid uh, being killed even in a fire or so on or or of allow them to avoid enemies and, and dangers that they otherwise would have to face and when you pass away if a person passes away in the in one of the these trances then regardless of any other karma that they've done they, it leads them to uh, the brahma worlds to to become a god or, or, or to, to live in the god realms so this is on the good side on um so, so on these two sides, this is this is called weighty karma. These are the karmas that override other karmas. Uh, the second type is something that is done uh, immediately, or that is is most immediate, the, the moment before. So, a karma that is done right when you're dying, for example, if you're if you if you're in a fight or something, and you you kill someone, and you're killed, uh, you know, there there's a um, a, a karmic activity at the moment of death then this is the next in order if you haven't done anything more weighty than that if you're engaged in this evil karma then then or good karma when you die then this is what's most likely to to have the effect and lead you on to the next life or or you know carry you in the moments after the physical body breaks up breaks apart and of course even in this life the good deeds that you do the bad deeds that you do um, at that moment will will have the effect first before other karmas are able to to have an effect so if you if you're you know if when you're dying you do a good or a bad deed you're you're engaged in meditation or you're engaged in in listening to the dhamma for example or you're engaged in sending loving kindness um, all, all of these things are going to take effect before you before any others and and the same in within the life so these are called um, immediate karmas or something like that the third one is uh, habitual karmas 
So if you're not doing anything karmic when you die and, and you just happen to pass away, what's most likely to come to mind and to carry you on and to, to you're most likely to fixate upon that which you've done habitually instead of fixating on what you're doing at that moment. If there's nothing particular you're doing, then the sorts of things that you've done habitually throughout your life, if it's meditation or charity or, or, or um, listening to the studying or listening to the Dhamma, you know, good things like that, then uh, that's what's most likely going to take you on to the next life. Uh, if you've done, if you've habitually done bad things, if you've been mean and nasty and or cruel and and uh, <coughs> harmful towards other beings, then that's most likely what's going obviously what's going to come back to your mind. Now, if you haven't done anything habitual, this is the third kind. There's the fourth kind is just this random karma that you've done, kata karma, karma that has been done means that if you're not a person who has done anything habitually and you haven't done bad deeds and you haven't done uh, and you're, you when you're dying if you haven't done any deeds it just it can often just be a random karma that you performed if one time in the past you killed someone um, quite likely that that it, there's a quite a good chance that that's going to be what you you fixate on even though you only did it once it's something that was most powerful you know you can see this in meditation this is what <clears throat> this is what comes up even in meditation. Of course, the habit, the the weighty karmas come up first. The immediate karmas come up second. The um, habitual karmas come up third, and finally, just random karmas will pop up in your mind if you if you did something really bad in the past. And when you're meditating, it comes up quite quickly. Another really good reason or purpose of meditation is to clean all this out and to see it all before it comes to be the only thing you've got left. So during meditation, these things come up and they can bring you great anguish and suffering if they were bad things. Um, but this is far better than if it'd be the only thing that you can cling to, if it'd be at the moment of death when that's all you've got and your mind clings to and follows it and, and winds up in a bad destination. So through the meditation, you're able to clean this up and you go through the very same sorts of experiences as if you were passing away because your mind is focused and you're not... Um, Acting and acting in the world in a similar way as to when you're dying, um, but but yet you know you, you it's it's innocuous. It's not going to lead you on to 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 create or to be the the foundation of the next moments. It's you've still got the physical reality in this life to to support you and sustain you. So something that you you know you can deal with and 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 overcome before it becomes something dangerous or something with the potential to bring. Uh, to, to, to be a large part of, of your future. This is the second grouping of, of, of karmas. The third grouping of karmas is when uh, karma has an effect. So karma doesn't necessarily have an immediate effect and this is another um, another useful um, teaching to help explain um, why karma doesn't seem to uh, work the way we think it does, where you do a good deed and you don't get a good result, you do a bad deed and you don't get a bad result, or you see people who are evil and they're getting lots of good things come to them and so on. <clears throat> this is because, uh, as as with all things, the results um, may not be immediate. They may not be immediately seen. Some karma has a result in this life, so you, you can see it. You do good deeds for people, uh, for sure, they become more friendly towards you. In fact, this is really it, it really is the case with most karma. It's just that we aren't looking closely enough. We expect to see things you know, like fireworks exploding. But at the same time, there are very real effects that we don't see because we're not observant enough. When you help people, when you're nice to people, often what happens is you've done nasty things to people in the past and then you think, well, I'll go, be an, I'll go and be nice to them. And you go and be nice to them and they're really rude to you. Why are they rude to you? Because of the, pa the deeds that you've done in the past. So then you think, well, that was useless, and you, you, you think, well, that person, there's no use helping them, I, you know, I tried, and so, you know, I guess I'll just be mean to them. And next time you come, they're nice to you. Why? Because you were nice to them, but you're mean to them again, and so on. We, we get easily discouraged in this way due to impatience and due to a misunderstanding about the nature of karma. So, you know, we, as a result, we often miss the potential, or we miss the, the results, and we don't realize that we have actually impacted um, the world around us. We have actually uh, helped ourselves through the karma. It has actually had a beneficial result. 
because we're not looking closely enough and we're expecting perhaps more or on a different um, level than than what is actually occurring but it is something that that has very much a basis in reality you do good deeds good things do come from them you just might not see them so <clears throat> If you have good intentions and they don't bring about a good result, they in fact bring out a bring about a, seem to bring about a bad result. You're not looking closely enough. You're not seeing exactly what your good intentions brought about. You're expecting too much. You're expecting uh, things on a different level, when in fact it may very well be that the next moment or the next day or so on that that, that good results come from these good intentions and and the good deeds that are based on the good intentions. So, but. At any rate, the kind, there are certain kinds of karma, or, or certain karmas will give results in this life. Certain karmas will give rise in the next life. So at the moment of death, they might come up and they lead you to be born um, somewhere based on 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 the prominence of those thing, those deeds, or the mem remembrance of those deeds at the moment of death. And they 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 might have an effect in in that next life based on on the connection and this is this is you know obviously m next most common because uh, of the connection between this life and the next life but the third the third type of karma in this categorization is ones that don't have a result in this life or the next life but have a result sometime in some future existence could be any time so it is possible that the results are so indirect that they only have a result in some future existence. Now, this this seems to be this is said to be the case with certain people who come to practice meditation or pra come to ordain in the time of the Buddha or practice meditation in the time of the Buddha. For some people, it was really easy to practice meditation, and the Buddha said, "Well, that's because they had practiced meditation lifetime, you know, many many lifetimes ago in a previous Buddha under a previous Buddha, or or even just by themselves, they had done something." that allowed them to see the truth of life, or see some sort of truth of life that um, gave them a an advantage over other people, gave them a head start in the meditation practice, and as a result it was very easy for them to become enlightened. Uh, other people it's very difficult to become enlightened. Some people were actually, in the time of the Buddha, unable to become enlightened because of things they had done far, far in the past. Even the Buddha himself, the reason he is said to have tortured himself for six years before he became enlightened. This is apparently not how it usually goes with a with a, a bodhisattva. When a bodhisattva, one who is going to become a Buddha, leaves home, it only takes them normally one night to become enlightened. That's that's how it normally occurs because uh, they're they're already ready for it. Now our Buddha is said to have taken six years because in some past life, many 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 lifetimes ago. He had insulted a Buddha, uh, a private Buddha, a Buddha, someone who was enlightened, or who had become enlightened by themselves, uh, saying that he was torturing himself. That, oh, look at this this um, misguided man who has gone up and tortured himself in the forest. How useless of him, something like that. And so he gave rise to this wrong view. And because of that, he had the wrong view in his past life, thinking, okay, now I want to do it. I must follow this this sort of path, even though he didn't realize that he had done that in a past life, this this mind state carried on, and when he started thinking about it, what clicked in his mind was the idea that he would have to go and torture himself, and so as a result, this is how the commentaries put it, but this is the theory, and this is how we understand karma to, to work, it, it may not have a result, because the mind is able to keep the sort of idea uh, in it, you know, from moment to moment, because each moment is based on the last, and so that by the time the idea of of, of something comes up, it it is still very much based on on these old, old, old karmas that that we perform. The mind is really that complex, and and reality is really that complex. The fourth type of karma in this categorization is those types of karma that are called ahosikam, which may mean karmas that don't have the opportunity to give a result. So it may be that you do something and it just never has the opportunity to come to fruition. Maybe it's cut off by other karmas or maybe it just happens to not find an outlet, not find you know, a, a way of, of bringing a result. But some teachers will just say it, it means that it, these are the, these, this means the karmas that have already had a result. So certain karmas are ahosi, 
meaning ahosi means was. Um, so it, the, the the meaning here is then that it's something that it's a has been. It's a karma that has already given its result. So certain karmas are now defunct. They have given their result and and will never give a result again. So that's called the twelve types of karma, three groups of of four. And I think that's important. I mean, I know it's a little bit technical, and, and, and for non-Buddhists especially, it's kind of uh, far-fetched in some ways, still the idea of, of future lives and so on. For, for, for many people, it's a hard thing to grasp because they're so caught up in this belief that the physical, physical death actually means something more than it, it actually does. So, um, still, I think it's useful to get a grasp of the idea that karma is much more complex than we ne we normally think of it. It's certainly not one to one. Um, it it you know it, it should be obvious if you think about it for a bit that of course it has to be like this. That karmas couldn't just magically bring their results. They have to interact just as everything else in the just as the physical universe does. They have to interact with other karmas and and other realities and and so we wind up with a very complex matrix of of karma and and of of deeds but uh so that one important thing the other important thing to understand is that certainly karma is simply those intentions that are are volitional that you 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 know you intend to hurt someone or you have the idea you have bad intentions towards other beings you have good intentions towards other beings you have some some uh, ethical volition in the mind. This is called karma. Now, the final thing I would say about karma is that it's not really the core of the Buddha's teaching. The, the point of the Buddha's teaching actually is to overcome karma. An enlightened being doesn't perform karma, not even good karma. They do a lot of deeds that appear to be good, but they simply do them out of you almost would say habit, but, but simply because it's appropriate to do. Simply because it there's nothing better that they could possibly do. They, they, they wouldn't have any reason to create the kind of um, disharmony that is caused by, by unwholesome, or that is required to perform an unwholesome karma. Good deeds are actually the more simple thing to perform, um, to some extent. Now, they wouldn't, the, the other point is that they wouldn't go out of their way to perform good deeds. They wouldn't have the idea that, oh, may this bring some result, or hoping to help other beings. They won't go out of their way to do that. If they're invited to teach, they will simply teach, and they will do it um, without any any feeling of um, a concern for their own well-being or attachment to their own happiness and, and their own pleasure. So as a result, they can often seem to be quite... Um, intent upon good deeds and self-sacrificing but it's because they have no attachment to self so they have no no need to 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 turn down the the, the offer or the the hopes of other people so when other people want their help um, they will do it within the con within the confines of what is reasonable what is appropriate and so on um, but but the point being that um, karma karma actually, is just another teaching to help us to understand the nature of reality on an experiential level. So when people say they can't believe in karma, they're really, with that statement, they're, they're misunderstanding what is the meaning of karma. Karma is a moment-to-moment -moment, uh, aspect of reality. It has to do with the cause and effect relationship of every moment. The reason why we suffer is because of karma, because we have bad intentions. When you cling to something, that's a bad intention. That's a karma that leads to suffering. When you have anger in your mind, this is something that leads to suffering, or it, it is suffering. Uh, the, the anger is, is something that is unpleasant in and of itself. So even a person who practices meditation properly for just a few days will come to understand what the Buddha meant by karma, will un come to understand how the mind works causally. It works moment to moment in a cause and effect manner. You know? So mind states affect future mind states. That's how karma works. So, not something difficult to understand, not something mysterious or, or hard to explain or hard to understand, but something impossible to pin down. So you couldn't say this karma is going to lead to that that result. The, the Buddha said there's 
no I think he said that that it's it's outside of the realm of anyone or it's only in the realm of a Buddha only a, Buddha, a fully enlightened Buddha someone who we understand completely understands or has, has completely purified their mind to the extent that they are able to understand the workings of the universe could tell you which karmas lead to which results it's just so complex I mean think of how complicated it is to predict the weather for example or to predict the future of physical particles you know they, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle I think says it's impossible um, so we just predict probabilities and the same of course because it's part of reality the same of course goes for karma it's uh, something that you, you can't really predict you can't say doing bad deed this bad deed will lead to this bad result all you can say is that bad deeds lead to bad results if they if they have a result it will be bad you know? And the Buddha was actually quite careful about this because if you say that um, a bad deed will lead to a bad result, then the Buddha said, well, then you have no way out of bad deeds, right? If a bad deed always leads to a bad result, then there's no way to be free from suffering. But he, he said, but if you say that the result of a bad deed will have to be bad, then you leave room for, freedom, for, for a way out of suffering because it may not lead to a result or, or it may be cut off by good deeds, which... Um, which prevent it from bringing about the bad result and so on. So, most important lessons: one, that karma is much more co complicated and and based on reality than people think, and two, that uh, it, karma is is um, it, it's the freedom from karma. It's it's something that we come to overcome, then we come to give up the desire to create karma. That 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 is most important karma is is a momentary thing that that should be a part and parcel of our meditation practice coming to realize the futility of or, or the meaninglessness or the purposelessness of performing bad deeds and eventually of even performing intentionally performing good deeds to the extent that we're able to just give up and let things go as they will and and interact with reality rather than react to it or or desire to build up to let go and to tear down, to, to, to give up, rather than to build up and to create artificial uh, structures, either physically or mentally. So, I hope that helps. Uh, helps people understand a little bit clearer about karma. Of course, the only way you're really going to understand karma is if you practice. It's not going to come from any sort of study or teaching. So, anyway, hope that has uh, encouraged you towards that because uh, you know another thing to encourage to encourage a little bit more is that this is uh, a truth of reality if you still have these bad intentions in your mind then no amount of of abstaining from this or that deed is going to save you even in your mind if your mind is full of anger and full of greed you are already setting yourself up for suffering in the future if not in this life then in the future life so some something that should really really encourage us to cultivate the meditation practice and to seriously put out effort to purify our minds and to come to understand this and come to see the futility uh, or the the disadvantages of clinging of, of craving of, of of creating karma uh, of any sort okay so thanks for tuning in here we go this is Hopefully not. Hopefully this this won't be the end of it, and I'll be able to continue on doing more videos like this. Of course, we have the Dhammapada series, which I'm uh, keen to get back into. It might take a week, another week or two, to get set up, um, but I'll try my best to get back as quickly as possible to making more videos. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for everyone who's kept up and, and sends their comments and so on. Um, look forward to seeing you all on our live. Uh, videos, live video chats that we'll be doing hopefully again Saturdays and Sundays and who knows we might be also doing daily uh, meditation sit sessions. Um, look, look for that on my YouTube channel. Anyway, thanks for tuning in.